everybody and welcome to River Bend Church. Who's glad to be here in the house of the Lord this morning? Anybody? All right. If you're joining us here uh, in the room or if you're joining us on Facebook Live, we're so glad to have you today as a part of the River Bend family. Uh, if you are in the room, make sure you take out your phones, open up the uh, Church Track app, check in, let us know you're here. Uh, if you don't have the Church Track app, app yet, shame on you. Uh, office, but if you scan the QR code on the pew in front of you, that'll carry you to an online connection card, and you can let us know you're here, give us prayer requests, sign up for events, all kinds of things. If you are joining us on Facebook Live, just simply click the link there on the feed, and it'll take you to that same card, and you can do all of those things. Uh, while you're doing that, I do have a couple of quick things to make you aware of. First of all, today is the last day. Everybody say, last day. Last day. Day. This is the last day to purchase raffle tickets from our women's ministry. Now, the raffle is going to help fund the fall retreat, and there are some amazing prizes this year. There's a black stone, a fire pit, a two-person inflatable kayak. See, that's a one-person for me. Uh, hand ca uh, it's a homemade lamp, lap quilt, uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. Tickets are $1 each, and they can be purchased from any one of our participating ladies. Uh, there's also going to be a quarter off auction that's going to be held in September, uh, and the ladies are currently looking for items for that. Uh, that could be gift cards, crafts, arts, basically anything new for men, women, and children. Uh, so make sure you're doing that. Check with your craft friends and see if they'll donate items. Uh, all of those things will be tax deductible. All of this helps our women's ministry continue to help women grow as disciples of Jesus. Uh, those donations that we're looking, uh, we're going to collect those now through August the 27th. If you have any questions about any of that, see Christy Dino. Christy, wait, raise your hand. She's our women's ministry leader here at Riverbend. She'll be glad to, to bring you up to speed. Uh, also, coming up pretty soon, uh, life groups are going to be beginning again. They'll be starting soon. So begin now to plan to connect with the life group. And don't forget, our Sunday school is meeting even now, uh, 915, every Sunday morning. These are great ways to continue to grow as a disciple of Jesus as you get into the gospel-centered community and help each other grow as disciples. So make sure you make those connections. You will not regret it. Well, now that's it for our announcements this morning. Uh, you can find out more information about anything going on around here on our website, Riverbend RM, Facebook groups, and find out all the great things that are happening in this church. So um, also make sure we are phasing out our Givelify app really soon. So we're going to be using exclusive our church track app for our online thing. Uh, but uh, we'll be doing that very soon, so remember to make that adjustment. That's it for our announcements. Now, who's ready to worship King Jesus this morning? Who came ready to worship? Because, see, here's the deal. You don't come to church and let folks... What kind of works is you come prepared and ready to worship the King. So I ask you again, who came this morning ready to worship King Jesus? Amen. All right. Well, let's hope that by the end of the service, the rest of you are right there with us. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, Riverbend. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, inviting him to join us this morning. And then I want you to really just reach deep within. Find that place where your heart connects with our fathers. And let's shower him with all the love and all of the worship that he's deserving of this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for this incredible day that you've given us to come into your house. What an awesome privilege it is to be able to join together, God, and join our hearts and our minds and totally and completely worship you this morning. We pray that everything that we say and do here will bring you much honor, glory, and fame this morning because you, Father, are alone, are worthy. Yes, God, Lord. we invite you here. Move among us. Impress on us everything that you would have for us. God, help us to take the things that we learn and see today and apply them to our lives so yes. that we may um, allow Jesus to shine through us during the week. Father, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. And all God's children said. Amen. Oh, my soul. 
There is a King of glory. There is a God who saves. One who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven. Lift up the shout of praise. There is a lion roaring. Jesus, the King of glory. So lift your eyes for standing on. There is one, only one, where my help comes from. There is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. y'all come on
Father, we thank you this morning that you are holy and that you never change. Thank you, God, that you've made it possible for us to worship you and have a relationship with you. And Father, I thank you that your grace through your Son has accomplished all of that. Today, Father, as we now bow before Your Word, I just pray that we would go ahead and make up our minds that what You say to us through this Scripture, we're going to obey it, Father. Because Your Word is not man's thoughts or, or man's intellect or man's words. Father, your, your word is from you. So today, Lord, I pray that you'd give us open hearts, open minds, and that God, we would choose this morning not to allow the enemy to steal this word before it even takes root. God, may we make up our minds right now that we're going to push aside all the distractions that would so easily pull our focus away from you this morning and hinder us from hearing what you want to say to your church. I pray that right now, God, we'll, we'll go ahead and decide. Doesn't matter what the person in front of me is doing. It doesn't matter what the person next to me is doing. It doesn't matter what that person over on the other aisle is doing. My focus today is going to be on the Word of God. Today, Holy Spirit, come and write this Word on our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 9 as our text today. That's Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 9. I do want you to open up your Bibles, but also we're going to have it on the screen. I'm going to ask everybody to stand with me. 
We're going to read this together. We want you to hear God's word in your voice. Uh, It has a great way of centering you on that word so that you can begin to receive what God wants to say to you through it. That's Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they went out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem at the Oak of Moriah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. He built an altar to the Lord there and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev. You can be seated. Two weeks ago we... We're in Genesis chapter 11, and we looked at an account of of people building a city and a tower. And what happens when we try to create a life outside of God's direction? That tower was called Babel, meaning confusion. You know, and that's a, a real hint that when we try to build a life apart from God and try to do it ourselves, it always leads to confusion and it never delivers what we hope that it would. You see, we were created to live our lives with God for His glory. See, when we do that, that's when life makes sense. Now, in the second half of chapter 11, we see a description of the family lineage of Noah's son Shem. Now, that's important because Shem's line brings us to Abram. You see, God had sovereignly chosen Abram to be the father of God's special people, Israel. God was creating for himself a people. And through that people, he would display his glory to all of the nations. And it was through this special people that God would send his unique son, Jesus, To reconcile sinful humanity to himself through Jesus' death and resurrection. You see, this is all a part of God's plan. Preparing for himself a people and through that people bringing his son. So that we might come to know Jesus as Lord and our sin be forgiven. You see, it's through faith in Jesus' finished work that he bore our, our death penalty. And we've had our faith in that trust in, that, in, in Him. And it's because of that faith that we become a part of God's redeemed people. So this is a very important chapter in, in the book here that we've been studying for so long. Because it shows us God tenderly shepherding us toward Himself. And I ought to tell you today that God wants us all to find Him. God wants us to have a relationship with Him because it's in the context of following Him and doing what He directs that we find the lives that we were truly looking for. Today, and as we look at this passage in chapter 12, these verses that we to Abram, His intention for His life, And we see Abram's response to that declaration. 
In this account, we find some important points to help us live through Jesus. The life that God declares for us. How many of you understand that this passage is about more than just Abraham? It's about us. It's about our life. You see, God really wants us to have a life that makes sense. Now, the the main idea that I want you to, to receive as we go through this is this. For life to truly make sense, we must listen to, trust, obey, and worship God in every area of our lives. Let me read that again. In fact, read it with me. For life to truly make sense, we must listen to, trust, obey, and worship God in every area of our lives. You see, there's a typo in that. You see it? Obey appears in that sentence twice. You know what? I'm glad there's a typo there because you know what? Obedience is critical. And so we'll get to that in just a minute. I want you to remember, confusion in this life results from our exclusion of God from our lives. If we want clarity in this life, we must include God in every area of our lives. I intentionally said every area. Because you see, there is no secular uh, spiritual divide in your life. I know some people live like that. They're they're one way on Sunday morning when they're at church and they live very differently throughout the rest of the week. We live with this idea that there is a secular spiritual divide, but folks, that's false. Everything in life is spiritual. Do you get that? When you carry the trash out in the morning, that's spiritual, y'all. When you're cleaning toilets, that's spiritual, y'all. Everything in your life is spiritual. Everything in your life, God wants to be a part of that. He wants to direct that. He wants you to clean toilets for the glory of God. Amen? So you're supposed to laugh at that. That's pretty funny, if I do say so myself. There is no secular and spiritual divide. God wants to be engaged in every area of our lives. This is demonstrated by Jesus. Do we see Jesus Living a a, a segmented, compartmentalized life? No, when we read the account of his life in Scripture, we see a, a man who was wholly focused on his Father's glory. Everything Jesus did was rooted in his desire to bring glory to his Father. And friends, when life is clear, when our lives are crystal clear... That's what's happening in our lives. We want God to be glorified by every part of our lives. That's when life is filled with joy. So the pathway to that type of life, the type of life that you're... Who in here wants to be miserable? Anybody? Raise your hand if you want to be miserable. Raise your hand if you want to be depressed. Raise your your hand if you want to walk through life like you've been sucking on a lemon. Y'all seen some people like that? That they just have that look on their face. It looks like they've been sucking on a lemon all day. I've been to some churches like that. Have you? I've walked into some churches and I've been looking around for a casket. Because folks are just absolutely act like they're in the church. That do you? I don't want people to say about me, here comes Steve. That's a sour dude. That dude brings a cloud. I want to be someone when I walk in the room, that it brightens the room. That people are automatically, they get a smile on their face because they see me coming. Not because I'm such a great guy. And Lisa, I am a great guy, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, honey. I appreciate that. Not be, but because God's grace and mercy is working through my life and every aspect of my life I want to glorify God in. Therefore, my life is really clear. My purpose is really clear. And therefore, I'm filled with God's joy. Who wants a life like that? Who wants a life that is marked with you? Well, friends, Abram gives us some really good clues as to how to have a life just like that. 
The first point for life must listen to God. For life to truly make sense, I must listen to God. Verse 1, the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your land, your relatives and your father's house to the land that I will show you. The Lord said to Abram. God spoke to him. God spoke to Abraham. Some of us in here, maybe all of us, often say, I wish God would speak to me. Who in here has ever expressed that? Whether it be openly with your voice or whether internally in your heart. I just wish God would speak to me. Nobody here but us and the Lord. God already knows and the rest of us already I wish God would speak to me. Friends, He has. Jared Wilson, in his book, Friendship with the Friend of Sinners, wrote this. Every time we open the Bible, it is a kind of burning bush moment. We're on holy ground and standing in the very presence. Jared's right, isn't he? Every time we open this book, why do y'all think I ask God when we gather for corporate worship? Because this is God speaking. It's not a human saying things to you. It's God. And I love how He brings in the burning bush. You remember the story of Moses? He goes out in the desert. He's, he's, he's running. And he goes and he sees this bush that's being, it's on fire, but it's not being consumed. So he draws near to it. And out of that burning bush, God speaks audibly to him. Now see, some of us would say, if God would just speak audibly to me, it would make a tremendous difference. No, it wouldn't. We think it would. But do you remember when Jesus was baptized and He came up out of the water and the Spirit descended on Him like a dove? God audibly spoke, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Everybody heard it. And they still crucified Him. So you think God audibly speaking to you is going to make a difference? If you won't obey this, you wouldn't obey that audible voice. You see, God has spoken. He is speaking to you through His Word. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, we read this. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped to every good work. That verse says everything you need to know about the Word of God. And I suspect the reason that we shy away from the reading of Scripture, we shy away from opening our Bibles any time other than we're in church, is because we don't like a couple of things on that list that Paul says Scripture does. It rebukes us. It corrects us. If we're going to have a clear life, we've got to learn to listen to God. You know, our first impulse when we have a problem is very critical. Let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest with yourself. Okay? Everybody promise to be honest with yourself. Raise your hand if you're going to be honest with yourself. You ain't going to lie, right? You're going to tell the truth. So help you God. Amen? All right? Okay. You're going to be honest. When you're confused about something in your life, who do you go to first? Think about that. When you got a problem, when something's going wrong, who do you go to first? I call my mama. Mama can always straighten me out. I used to do that a lot. I talked to mama a lot about my problems. I miss her. I miss being able to call her. Maybe it's a best, a best friend. 
Someone that's trusted, that you know is a confidant or has your back. Maybe you go to helpful information. Amen? I couldn't fix anything in my house without Google. You can find just about anything you want on Google. Amen? Where, where, who do you turn to when life's not clear? My guess is we all have something that we turn to. But where should we turn? Where should we turn? See, we, we'll say things if, if asked. Do y'all believe that God is sovereign over all creation? Do you believe that? Do you believe God is all knowing? He knows everything. There's nothing that God does not know. Do y'all believe that? Do y'all believe that God is all powerful? There's nothing that's beyond his scope or power to accomplish. Do y'all believe that? Do you believe that God is perfect? That he never makes a mistake. He always does the right thing at the right time. Do we believe all that? Then why don't we turn to him first? Before we speak anything to somebody else, we should be speaking it to God. Maybe God will use others to confirm what He's speaking to you through His Word. But you see, as long as we are seeking human sources, we're never going to have the life that God wants us to have. If we exclude His voice from our life, we are going to miss what God is saying to us. We're not going to listen to God. We're going to listen to everybody else. Friends, we need to develop the discipline. If we're following Jesus, we need to develop the discipline of reading God's Word every day. Oh boy, I just dropped something on y'all, didn't I? You mean I got to read it every day? See, there's the problem. I've got to read it. No, you don't have to read it. Ask God to give you a desire to read it. I can't tell you how, you know, putting a, a creating a discipline in my life to sequentially read through the Bible uh, every year using a Bible reading plan. I can't tell you, uh, I can't overestimate or, or exaggerate the importance of that discipline in my life and how it's changed my life. I can't tell you how many times that I have been, been, been confronted with something and immediately, out of nowhere, a scripture I read last week in my Bible reading plan speaks directly to that issue that I'm dealing with. I can't tell you how many times that's happened. See, that's how God's Word acts. The Bible is called the living Word of God. It's alive, it's active, and it's always reading us as we read it. Friends, if we're going to have a clear life, we must listen to God. But secondly, if we're going to have a life that makes sense, we must learn to trust God. For life to truly make sense, we must trust God. Verses 2 and 3. God says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse you with will be blessed. Rudiments of those verses. God says, I will make you. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. He's saying what he will do. Not what Abram back in chapter 11 when they were building the, the city and the tower. What did they say? They literally said, let us for ourselves. Do you see the contrast there? Me trying to build it, me trying to do it, always leads to confusion, a bunch of babble. But when I let God do it through me and in me, then I begin to see the life that God has been I'm trusting. Thank y'all for your honesty. The rest of you are a bunch of liars this morning. Sometimes it's hard to trust, isn't it? It's hard to trust God sometimes, isn't it? Because people failed us. People have, have hurt us. 
People have have done things to us. And so we we're not going to trust anybody because every time we trust somebody, we end up getting hurt. So why should you trust God? Why should you say, God, I hear you, I can't see it, but because you said it, I'm going to believe it and I'm going to build my life on those promises. Why should we do that? I'm glad you ask. God is inherently good. He cannot sin. Therefore, He cannot act in any way that is evil. He will never do something to you that is spiteful. He will never treat you like a a lab rat doing experiments on you to see how you react. He will never harm you in any way because it's a hundred percent impossible because of his nature we, we read in scripture in numbers 23 19 god is not a man that he might lie or a son of man that he might change his mind does he speak and not act or promise and not fulfill God will always do what He said He will do. Let me go ahead and break it down. If you're not seeing the promises of God revealed to you in Scripture for your life coming to pass in your life, it's not because God is incapable. So only, that only leaves one person, right? And that's who? You. If we're going to seek the clarity of life that God wants to provide for us, we must trust God. Trust Him. That, that's, that's scary. Can I, can I be real with y'all? We have to learn to trust God's plan. Even when it doesn't make sense. Remember, He told Noah to build a boat when it hadn't rained and he lived in the desert. He had to trust God. I don't know what a boat is, but I'm going to build it. What you show me, I'm going to do. Had no clue. Can you imagine how people picked on Noah? People walking by and Noah's building. What are you building, Noah? A boat. What's a boat? I don't know yet. When it's finished, we'll know. We'll both know. Why are you building a boat? God said it's going to rain. What? What's rain? He said water's going to fall from the sky. What? Yeah, he said it's going to fall from the sky and it's going to fall so much of it and the water's going to break from it and it's going to come up out of the ground and it's going to be so much except who's in that boat. Can you imagine? They probably looked at him like he grew another head. They ridiculed him. I guarantee you when the water started falling and Noah was safely inside the ark, it all made sense. It all made complete sense. See, that's how it is with our lives. God asks us to trust Him even when it doesn't make sense. He asks us to believe that He has spoken through His Word and if we will trust Him, He's going to work it through for His glory. And see, that's a big, huge thing. Do y'all realize that God's promises are always rooted in His glory? Did you hear the stuff that God said He was going to do for Abram? I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make of you a great nation. Those who who curse you, I'm going to deal with them. I mean, those are some cool promises, aren't they? And Abram could have got a big head about that, couldn't he? Look at me. God's going to bless me. It wasn't about Abram. It was about God creating a people through Abram. Abram, through which he was going to send his son into the world to suffer, bleed, and die so that we could be reconciled to God. How many of y'all know God's promises are about his glory, not ours? If we're going to have a clear life, we've got to learn to trust God. If we're going to have a, a life that truly makes sense, we also must learn obey God. Remember, we this point is in critical because you see, hearing from God is not the goal. Obeying God is the goal. Let's look at verses four through six. 
So Abram went and told him. I'm going to stop right there. Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Now remember, he told him to get up out of the land and go where I will show you. God did not give him the destination. He didn't call him up one day and say, Hey, Abram, I need you to jump on I-40, go about 60 miles, and you'll be in Raleigh. And I want you to be in Raleigh tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. That makes sense, doesn't it? That gives us a, a, a destination. It gives us a, something to aim for. No, God just said to Abram, Hey, Abram, get up out of your comfortable life that you have created up among your people. Walking, and when you get there... Hey, hey, Mama. Mama, God told me to get up and get out of my comfortable place and start walking. And, and I'll... And I, when I get no, no, it didn't sound right to me. I, I, that God couldn't possibly have said that to me. I must have got that wrong. You know, you're, thank you, Mama. Hey, Chad. God, God told me to get up out of my comfortable life last night and start walking. And when I got there, He would tell me I was there. Does that, does that sound right to you? No, me neither, man. That's crazy, isn't it? And that's crazy. Yeah, I know, man. I must have ate something wrong. I don't know. I don't know. But, but th thanks, man. No, I ain't going nowhere. Is that how, was that what he did? Abram listened to God. He trusted God. And therefore he obeyed and started walking. See, that's the problem with some of us in this room today. It's not that we're not hearing God. It's not that we don't trust God cosmically. We just don't want to obey God. We just don't want to do what he's asking us to do because it doesn't make sense to us. And that's why we're living a confused life right now. It's not a hearing problem. It's not a trusting problem. It's an obedience problem. Can I go ahead and break something down for y'all this morning? I know there's all kinds of preachers you can watch on television that'll tell you that all you got to do is do this and God's going to do this, 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 and this because He's obligated. You know what God is obligated to you for? Nothing. He's God. You're not. God is God. He is sovereign. He's the King. He's the, the lawgiver. He, he's, the, he's the one who created you. He's the one who knew you before He formed you in your mother's womb. He is God. The word no does not belong in any sentence that we speak to God. If we want a clear life, we got to get up and start moving. Don't miss the fact that Abram had gotten really complacent and really comfortable. He was doing well. He had acquired a lot of stuff there with his, his kin people. He had acquired a lot. In those days, they, they calculated wealth not by, by money, but by possessions like how many the herds that you had, how many household servants you had. That determined how, how wealthy you were. Abram, by all accounts in Scripture, was really wealthy. He was doing well. And out of nowhere, God says, Hey, Abram, I want you to start walking, brother. Walk away from that comfort. Walk away from that complacency and start following me. And Abram had to make a decision. Am I going to do what God said? I love that verse, the simplicity of it. It simply, it did. Notice what it doesn't say. I mean, verse 4 to very, and Abram went. He went. Didn't, doesn't say he sat down and counted the cost. He didn't sit down and say, okay, let's put a, a, a pro and con column. And let's, let's try to make a, a good decision here. Doesn't say he sat there and argued with God. But who in here has argued with God before? 
Have you ever won? Then why are you still arguing with him? I've never won either. And I've come at him with, I thought, some pretty good arguments. How are you going to win an argument with God? He didn't argue. He just went. He just went. See, that's exactly what we've got to do if we are going to have the clear life that we desire. Point four. For life to truly make sense, I must worship God. I must worship God. Check this out. Verse seven. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord. Then jump down to verse eight. He's traveling. He gets to another location. He pitches his tent. He sets up shop. Apparently God said, this is where I want you to be between Bethel on the west and I on the east. And notice what he first does when he does that. He built an altar to the Lord there. And he called on the name of the Lord. Wherever Abram went, he built an altar. He worshipped everywhere he went. You know why? See, worship is the great clarifier. Worship tells us who we're trying to glorify. Your life? Or are you trying to glorify yourself? Make a name for yourself. We're going to build this tower that reaches into heaven. We're going to go upstairs and we're going going to see God. We're going to make for ourselves a name. Look at us. Look how great we are. Look at our glory. That leads to confusion every time. Because God will not share His glory with anyone. Because... He's God. God isn't some great big narcissist in the sky who requires our worship because He's got to have it. No, God declares that we worship Him because He's God. And He deserves our worship. Amen? Abram worshipped everywhere he went because he wanted it clear that God gets the glory from my life. Worship is our reminder where the glory belongs. Matt Chandler says it this way. Worship is the way of life for those entranced by and passionate for the glory of God. Can I tell you a pet peeve? More recently. We've created a North American church that puts priority on the weekend worship gathering. The goal is to get as many people in one room as you can and to make them feel something. And if we can make them feel something and send them out smiling and happy, They'll go and tell five friends how happy and good they feel. And next Sunday, they'll bring back five friends and we'll have an even bigger crowd. That's what it's all about, isn't it, church? Getting bigger, bigger and bigger. And everybody's smiling when they leave here. Everybody feeling good about themselves when they leave here. That's what church is all about. It's all about us all the time. Amen? Somebody taught y'all well. Church is about God's glory. And we can't whip that up. We can't make you so excited that suddenly the glory of God appears. That's not our goal. When we come in here to worship, we come because that's the natural expression of a heart that's been changed by Jesus Christ. 
A heart that's learning to hear God. A heart that's learning to trust God. A heart that's learning to obey God will always worship God. Because we see in every phase of that the goodness of God. We see that His plan is way better than anything we could try to create for ourselves. We understand that the life that He has for us is far better than anything we're going to create on our own. We are never a life that will compare and through your life if you will simply trust and obey. You can't outbuild God. But we try. And I'm going to call it for what, I, what it is. In our stupidity, we think Worship me. I want you to notice something as we bring the plane in for landing. Y'all think I'm circling the airport. I'm coming in. When you begin to seek God like this, listening to Him, by getting into his word. Trusting the promises that we find him speaking over us in his word. And as we hear those promises and hear him speaking, we obey and do the things that God has spoken in his word. And we begin to worship God because we want him to receive all the glory. When all that begins to happen in our lives, guess what happens? All the people on earth will be blessed through you. That's what he told Abram, isn't it? You obey me, Abram. All the people on earth will be blessed through you. And we know now what he meant. Through his line came Christ. Friends, it's the same for you and me. Because see, that's what you discover when you begin to follow Christ. It's not about you. It's about Him. And as we grow in, in these, these disciplines that I've talked about this morning, all of a sudden we begin to see God using us for His glory. We start seeing lives changed because we came in the room. We start seeing hope being built in the room because we are following Christ. We're doing what Christ told us to do. We're living our lives submitted to Him. And all of a sudden, people's lives are being changed. Friends, when we get to the end of our lives, I'm going to be preaching a funeral at 2 o'clock today. Just a few hours. 67 years old. Miss Kathy Boykin. If you had the pleasure of meeting her. You know she was a very sweet soul. She wasn't able to attend a lot because she was sick. This was her second occurrence of cancer. And though she fought it valiantly and bravely. The cancer took her life. On Thursday morning. Friends. Oh, excuse me. Friday morning. Friends. Life's a vapor. Y'all get that? Life's a vapor. And I'm not stand, standing up here saying these things to you. Because I'm trying to guilt you into doing something. Or trying to play on your sense of mortality. To get you to make a decision. I find that decisions based on those things, fear of death and fear of mortality, never are, 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 are real. They're simply responding to the fear. And as soon as you take the fear off, you revert back to where you were. I'm just merely pointing out the fact that this life is short. In a few weeks, I'm going to celebrate my 54th birthday. 
54 trips around the sun for this old boy. And you know what my thought is right now? How in the world did that happen? And most of you sit, you're thinking the same thing, aren't you? About yourself. How, where did the time go? I tell, say that to simply say this. How much time are we wasting chasing our tails? Trying to create for ourselves a life that makes sense? Trying to build it ourselves? Trying to do it? How, how much time are we wasting when God has already told us right here in the pages of Scripture? He holds it all in His hand. So I ask you this. Who are you trusting this morning? Who are you listening to this morning? Who are you obeying this morning? Who are you worshiping this morning? One path leads you to confusion. But following Jesus will lead you to peace. Who are you following this morning? The fact that you're still breathing. Let's do a breath check right quick. Everybody hold your hand up in front of your face. Do you feel air? As long as you're still breathing. That's grace. That's grace. That means God is saying to you, it's not too late. It's not too late to stop, turn, and follow me. That's the path to the life that you've really been looking for. That's the clear life. Which path? Are you traveling? Would you pray with me? I want to invite the prayer team to join me up front. and As they're doing that, I want to ask you to stand. Father, I come to you right now and I just pray that the enemy would not be able to do what you said in your parable that he likes to do. When the seed of the word hits the, the ground of our heart, he likes to send the birds to snatch it away before it can take root. Father, I promise you in this room, the enemy doesn't want any of us in this room to hear you trust you to obey you and he certainly don't, doesn't want us to worship you so right now I pray that the enemy would be barred from speaking into any person in this room that at this holy moment when you are here meeting with your people as we worship you I pray I pray, God, that Your Word would, would go deep into our hearts and Your Holy Spirit would just take that Word and multiply it in our hearts so that a crop of righteousness is being, being realized from you, that You would drop heavy on every heart in this room. Mine first, Father. I know I have grieved You, Holy Spirit, by my disobedience. I know I have grieved you in many ways, but right now, Father, I repent. That just uh, causes me to really see myself as you see me, God. That I might repent and I might follow harder after Jesus because that's the pathway. That's the pathway to the life I'm really looking for. So today, Lord, in this room, speak to our hearts, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name.
Today, if you're here and you tried to, you've been trying to build your own life, and you don't have a relationship with Christ, you never said, and I want to follow you. I want to invite you today to agree with the Holy Spirit and say, yes, Jesus is Lord. If that's you this morning, I want you to come down here. And I want you to tell one of these people that, hey, I've just said in my heart, Jesus, you're Lord. And we want to pray with you. And we want to help you take your first steps. As well. Friends, I wish I could tell you that when you do that, that now you're no longer incapable of trying to build your life on anything other than Christ. But that's just not true. There are many Christian years. And, and you might be trying to create a life for yourself. And the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now and He's bringing conviction. How many of y'all know that when the Holy Spirit brings conviction, that's the most grace-filled thing that could ever happen to you? We don't like it. It hurts. Who in here likes to be told they're wrong? Okay, multiply what you feel about about a power of ten and you might be getting close to me. I hate for somebody to tell me I'm wrong. Amen, Lisa? Lisa's good at it, though. You're really good at it. We don't like it. Friends, when the Holy Spirit brings conviction, it's because He's tenderly shepherding our lives back in line with Him. Because that's where the good stuff is. That's where the blessing is. That's where the peace is and the joy and all today. This altar's open. These folks are here to pray. Let's just let God do what He wants to do. Amen. As Pastor Jimmy leads us in some worship. Let's just do. Groups back, make sure that you're looking at that because it's a great way to connect. 
all the studies at Sunday school and just any time that you can gather together with your Christian friends for support and for love, never forsake the assembling. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you and we thank you for allowing us to see your heart this morning. And we just pray, God, that we will take the things that you have placed within us this morning and apply them to our lives, Father, that we may be the love that people need in this world as we come in contact with you to use us as you will, Father, and continue to teach us and grow us as you will, Father. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray and all God's children said. And remember, we are not dismissed. We are.